Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan. The Parents Circle is an extraordinary NGO that brings together Israeli and Palestinian parents, parents who have lost children in the conflict between Israel and Palestine. Joining me to discuss the work of this extraordinary NGO uh, and to tell us what's happening uh, in the region and what lies ahead in the future, and in particular, the inspirational work that you and your colleagues do is Robbie Damelin, uh, activist, parent, and of course, representative of the Parent Circle. Why don't we start this interview by you telling us a little bit about uh, your journey from being just another parent to being an activist. In 2002, we know that your son David was killed by sniper fire, and uh, your response to that uh, was that you didn't want your son's death to be an excuse for revenge to be taken. But how, how did your journey then begin from that initial gut reaction as a parent that your son's death should not be the cause of further suffering for anybody? How did you make that journey from there to becoming an activist? I think when you look back in <coughs> your life to social justice, anybody who does this kind of work, if they start to really dig from their childhood, I remember, obviously, I come from South Africa originally. I remember as a five-year-old child, I stole a horse from the dairy because they were beating the horse. And I brought it home and put it in our tennis court. And my father arrived home and found a horse in the tennis court. But that was an act of social justice, was to prevent this horse from being beaten. Right. And all through my life, I can find the equivalent times that created the survivor in me. I'm very also influenced by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and by the miracle of South Africa. I mean, South Africa is not the Garden of Eden. Right. But nevertheless, if you consider what could have happened, there would have been a bloodbath there. And yet people could find a way not to kill each other and to stop the violence and to end the racist behavior. So that gives me hope. And, and I think after David was killed, I, I mean, I'm told that one of the first things that I said is you may not kill anybody yes. in the name of my child. And yes, that was the beginning of a so, path. So David was a reservist, like many young Israeli Yes, they all have uh, to go women, to exactly. reserves. Yeah. David was a student at Tel Aviv University, and he was part of the peace movement, and he was studying for his master's in the philosophy of education. So if you look at that, you understand that you never know who the person is behind the gun. People think they know, and they like to give a label. Yeah. But when he was called to go to reserves, he didn't want to serve in the occupied territories. And he came to talk to me. And he said, if I don't go, what will happen to my students? Because he was teaching philosophy to kids who were going to be inducted into the army. And if I don't go, what will happen to my soldiers? Because he was the officer. And if I go, I will treat people with dignity. And so will all my soldiers. So. You know, and, and I was filled with a sense of dread. And, um, but I very soon realized that this man didn't kill David because he was David. If he'd have known him, he could never have killed him. I mean, it was just not, that's part of the whole problem right. of everything that happens is that we don't know each other. Since the second uprising intifada, there's almost no contact between Israelis and Palestinians. And with that, that just creates a sense of fear and hatred. It's coming out now, these very days in the streets right. of, of Jerusalem. Right. Where again, there's been an escalation of... Well, attacks. if you look at <coughs> who, who, who has become active now, that's the saddest part of this whole story, is you see children aged 13 going out because they think they're invincible. They also are emulating their parents' behavior in the second uprising. It's a very normal kind of reaction in a way. Right. Because what hope have these kids got? Right. And, and that's where the investment needs to come in creating a future for these children. That's not only indicative of Israel and Palestine. That could be a world lesson. I mean, we only have to look at what is happening right. all over the world to start to think. It isn't that there's a universal panacea for, for uh, terrorism. But there are many reasons, and each country has its own reasons. And a 13-year-old kid living in, a, in, in um, a refugee camp, maybe this is, and he's also bored. I know this sounds extraordinary, but he is. 
because there isn't anything for him to see as a future. Right. I look at my grandchild, who's 13. He goes to basketball four times a week. He goes to a democratic school. He has a future ahead of him. What future does this little kid who lives in a refugee camp have? Right. Uh, David's death obviously triggered something in you, your desire to be active, come together with other parents and try to find a solution to this problem. Was, was that feeling and desire and perception on your part shared by other members of your family? Very or, or, or was much there, so. Or was there a debate uh, within, within the family as well? I come from a very liberal sort of family anyway. My uncle defended Mandela in okay. the, the first treason trial. I had a mad uncle who walked with Gandhi from Peter Maritzburg to Johannesburg. So I guess it's somewhere in the genes. Right. <laughs> so he also gave Gandhi his first farm and came to India with him. His name was Kallenbach. Right. And so um, there was something in me. I knew I wanted to do something. Um, not, nothing would stop me. I um, was invited to go to a seminar by a religious Jewish man. He said, come and meet families of people who've lost children. But it wasn't, you know, we're not only an organization of parents, it's also the families. Okay, right. So okay. I said, I don't want to go because I didn't want to share this um, pain with others, right. Right. you know? It's like, what am I carrying the whole, everybody else's pain as well as my own? Because there's nothing, there's nothing worse than losing a child. Whatever other thing, I'm a big fixer, but I can't fix this. So it's a choice that you make. And um, I was invited to go to this weekend, and I eventually went. And to I a met, meeting of the parents, I call. Yes. Okay. And I met um, Palestinian women, mothers, who'd lost children. And when I looked into their eyes, I recognized that we shared the same pain. And that led me to believe that we could be the most amazing um, voice for sanity and for reconciliation if we could speak together. And so I started to travel all over the world. And my, the main complaint of my son was that um, I'm not such a great grandmother. But they got used to it, you know. And, and um, he says in this film which we made that I'm the person who, in the food chain, brings the sweets when I come back from overseas. <laughs> so I think I'm going to bring a whole bunch of Indian sweets. <laughs> You'll have plenty to choose from because this, yeah, is, I know this is that... Uh, that Horrible festive season, horrible for those of us who uh, <laughs> dread putting on weight. Yeah, but, well, um, I'm one of those. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me, uh, b before this tragedy of, of David's death, uh, I know that you say that you came from a political family, uh, and you've had a tradition of fighting for social justice, uh, but you weren't politically active in any way prior to David's death, were you? Um, uh, I uh, was very active in... Um, coexistence projects, okay. not in political projects. Right. And the Parent Circle isn't a political organization. Right. It's not, that is, of course, we're all political people, right. but we're not affiliated to any political party. Right. No, I meant political in the, in the widest possible but any sense. any peace yeah. work right. is political, exactly. actually, if yeah. you think about it. So um, I did a lot of that work, and the anti-apartheid work right. in South Africa was mainly to annoy my parents, if right. I think back, you know, if I'm honest. Right. But this is not work. This has taken over my life totally because right. I so I believe so strongly that without reconciliation, we'll never end this. We will have a ceasefire, maybe. Mm. That's why actually the vision of this whole organization is to create a framework for a reconciliation process right. to be an integral part of any future peace agreement. Right. So uh, tell me something about the specific work of the parent circle, because I, would, I mean, it's at one level, it's inspirational that you can have uh, parents and families from uh, both, you know, so-called sides of the divide, uh, united by their loss, by their bereavement, uh, and sh because they share that, they share that, they have that in common. But there are probably plenty of differences of opinion within the Palestinians and Israelis and between them, I would imagine. How do you negotiate those? Well, firstly, differences? this is not an equal situation okay. at all. <laughs> The Israeli is the stronger side, and um, building trust takes time. I told you that I think the initial sharing of pain creates a sympathy for each other, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have an empathy for each other's narrative. Mm. And so um, 
we tried to think within the parent circle what we could do. And I'm telling you this because this is a project that, for instance, I met a woman from Sri Lanka, and she's very interested to import this project into Sri Lanka, and it can be adapted to any conflict. Mm. What we discovered was that um, we would have to go very deeply into each other's narrative, both historical and national and personal. And so there were 140 of us within the group, 70 Palestinians and 70 Israelis. And we decided to go on this total, almost pilgrimage to discover who was on the other side. One of the first things that we did was to go to the Holocaust Museum. You can't take for granted that 70 Muslims will come to the Holocaust Museum. What did they have to do with that? On the contrary, they actually lost their homes because of many of the immigrants that came. Mm. And so that was a very big gesture, but it wasn't for comparison of suffering. We did that because we wanted people to understand, if you do not understand that part of the Jewish history, you will never understand the DNA of fear. And the fear of the Israelis, the worst enemy of the Palestinians. Particularly and when politicians take hold of that fear. Of course, and, and they fear. use it. Exactly. All the time. Yeah. And then um, the next part of this project was to have a Palestinian historian and an Israeli historian give us the milestones of our history through their eyes. It's called History Through the Human Eye, the project. And so what happened was you take 1948, that's the War of Independence yeah. for Israel. That's a happy occasion of a, a new state born. But it was the Nakba, the catastrophe for the Palestinians. Palestinians. They lost their homes. And so then you take all the dates, the Balfour Declaration, you know, we all seem to have suffered from the British somehow. Sorry, I shouldn't maybe say no, that. Feel free. <laughs> <laughs> feel free. <laughs> so, I mean, it's everywhere I've been, you know, yeah. India, South Africa. South Africa, yeah. South Africa. But it's the War of Independence, it's the 73 war, it's the 67 war, it's all of the, the uprisings. How does each side see that? And when they actually describe it, it isn't that you all become Martin Luther King and fall into each other's arms and love each other. No. But you would have an empathy from understanding how the other person sees their history. And that, after all, is a very good beginning of negotiation. The next day, we went to a village, which is now Israel, a Palestinian village, which two members of our group came from there. And when we got there, there was nothing left. And this one mother started to cry. And she looked down and she found the well that she'd drawn water out of a child, as a child. And then you recognize um, the longing. It isn't that you're going to go and build a Palestinian village again, but you would understand, and there comes empathy. And the whole purpose is to create an empathy for the way the other person sees their life. And of course, if you look back on your life, when you think on your childhood, everything seemed a lot more big, a lot bigger and a lot right. tastier. I mean, I know that whenever I go back to South Africa, I think I should eat sweets that I ate as a child, and they're so dreadful, you know, but they seemed, there's something romantic about your past. Right. Your house is much smaller than you really thought it was. And so this project became something which created a trust, which means that we work together um, regardless of the situation, right throughout the Gaza war, right throughout all the wars, the Intifada, we work together because there is that basic trust and because we understand that we have to affect the situation. It can't affect who we are. And so what came out of this was we understood the trust that suddenly got, that changed our group completely. And then we realized the potential for taking it out into the general public. Right. And then there are small <coughs> elements of miracles that happen because we met the head of um, Georgetown University in Washington and he invited 12 of us to come and train the trainer at Georgetown University. And um, from that we developed this program for the general public and we run it for doctors, for educators, grannies. Grannies, of course, were the best. Why? No, it was because grannies have got three generations of memories to share, right. you know? And um, they have to do a project together. It's 15 Palestinians and 15 Israelis in each of these projects that we do. We speak in schools. If you go into an average Israeli school and you will ask a kid with a Palestinian, who of you have ever met a Palestinian? It will be nobody. Mm. 
you know, and who speaks Arabic? Maybe one out of the whole class. And who's been overseas? Maybe 90% of the class. So there's this total cutoff, and suddenly they meet a Palestinian who's also lost a member of his family, yeah. who's got up probably very early in the morning to come through the checkpoints to their classroom. And suddenly they see the humanity, because when you see the humanity in the other, that's the beginning of the end of conflict. And so the same applies to the other side. I, I went into a school in East Jerusalem, and all the girls were covered. And one of the kids stood up and she said, your son deserved to die. And you know, your normal wow. reaction would be you would just get up and walk out. Right. But I kind of looked at her, and I got it. She came from a bereaved family, you know, and I started to ask her what happened and how did her mother react and how did the whole family react. And then I asked her what color the tears were. And she suddenly, she had a kind of emotional breakthrough, which is what we do all the time. And she got up and she came and she hugged me and she said, I'm sorry. And that was an even braver act than saying what she said because she became the hero of the classroom. Because what Israelis did she ever meet? She met soldiers or settlers. And just incidentally, if we're already talking about the settlers, the most important thing we can be doing now is to talk to the settlers. Because if you exclude people from your, from your circle of talking, they become more radical. How effective have you been with them? Because from the outside, from our perspective here, from what we read and see, they seem the most militant, uh, racist in their attitude. How effective have your interventions been with the settler community? I'll give you one example. Yeah. Just, it's interesting because it actually happened with me, so I, you know, I know, and I work a lot. Where I'll talk to anybody, um, because what's the point of talking to people who love you? That's right. very nice, and maybe your ego gets very fat, but right. it's not going to make... It is important, by the way, to talk to other peacemakers, because they need to be encouraged. What happened was, I don't know if you remember, but there were three um, soldiers, uh, three young men, kidnapped and killed, Israeli guys. And then there was a Palestinian who was killed by the settlers and very violently burnt. And we recognized that the parents circle immediately that mm -hmm. this was going to be the beginning of a cycle of violence. And so we created a tent. It's called the Peace, well, it's called Peace Square, which we sat every night and invited people to come to talk. And, and then the war started. We knew that was going to happen. And when the war started, of course, people became very fearful because they discovered those tunnels right. that the Hamas dug. And you see, when you've got um, a huge uh, device against rockets, the Iron Dome, then you don't feel totally threatened personally. But when you have tunnels, your imagination runs right and you suddenly think the ground will open and out will come a whole bunch of guys to kill you. So there was a lot of anger on the streets of Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And one night uh, a settler came and he sat, I don't know, about 50 yards. Is it yards or feet or what do you have here? Uh, we use feet, meters, yeah. yards have gone out now. Yards is uh, out, yeah. the British, <laughs> you lost the British influence. In any event, the settler came from one of the most um, messianic crazed settlements. And he had lost his first home when we had the disengagement from Gaza. During the time of Arik Sharon, there was a disengagement. So his first home he lost, and he went, I mean, from the frying pan into the fire. He had to go and choose to live. And he was sitting and screaming at us. And um, for the first time probably in his life, a group of people actually listened to him. I mean, people of opposite opinion. Right. And he was pretty shocked because we let him go on for about 20 minutes. And then I went to talk to him, and I said, look, you know, I understand your pain. I live in Tel Aviv. I'm not losing my home. I understand. But you must become a part of your future. And then I told him a story about David. The night before David was killed, he spent the whole night with a settler talking about the philosophy of Judaism. And during, I don't know, sometime during the night, he got up to go and make coffee for his soldiers. And this guy said to him, look, you know, why are you making coffee for your soldiers? They should be doing it for you. And he said, no. That's what's being a leader, is I should be doing it for them. And so after David was killed, the settler came to see me. And um, he was frightened to come to my house because I'd said, I mean, my opinions about the were occupation known immediately. Yeah. were known immediately. 
And um, I said, of course you can come. And he came to my house and he told me the story. And when I told the settler at the Peace Square the same story, he started to cry. You see, because there's his humanity. That's what I keep saying. It's, this whole work is so difficult. You know, after thinking that I was such a big deal and traveling all over the world and talking in the House of Commons and in Congress and all kinds of places and, and you know, because I could talk English so, well, be it with a South African accent, still, you know, I could really work very hard for the parents' circle. And then one night I came home and the army came to tell me they caught the man who killed David. And that's when it became really difficult. That was the time when I thought, I can't do this work unless I'm willing to walk the walk. And it took me a long time to write a letter. It's a long story. I wrote a letter to the family, and, and um, they were very shocked. And you didn't get a very nice reply back. Oh, you read it? I read it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but you see, there's no such thing as instant reconciliation. Right. People, and besides, the minute I had written the letter, I gave up being a victim. Right. And if I can give anybody a present who's watching, that's what I would give, because being a, being a victim destroys your life. But if you can give up being a victim, you become free. That doesn't mean you forget, you know? And it doesn't mean that it's rainbows and flowers and bad right. poetry. It's not. It's a very, very difficult journey to take. But um, that's when I went to South Africa to look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and to understand what lessons we could learn. And that's where I met the most extraordinary people who were perpetrators and victims. Hmm. And how, how um, I met this white South African woman whose daughter had been killed by APLA, which was the military wing of the African National Congress. And she'd gone to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And she said, I forgive you. Right. And I wanted to know what she meant. Because what is forgiving? What does that mean? You give up your right to revenge? Or you give up your right to justice? Or what does it mean? Or you should forget? Or the person can do it again? There's loads of, all this right. was going on in my own heart for such a long time. And I met her and she said, forgiving is giving up your just right to revenge. And I thought, wow, that really, you know, that talks to me and understanding why, because I understood from the parents, right. once we sent the letter, right. that the guy who killed David had seen his uncle very violently killed when he was a small child. And afterwards he lost two uncles in the second uprising. He went on a path of revenge. It's clear. Right. He wasn't politically motivated, by the way. Right. That he became a folk hero afterwards right. because he actually killed 10 people. Right. Um, so, I think that became such a big part of my life, this understanding. Right. She was my sister, you know? And she gave me this big gift of thinking. And then I met the man who actually sent the people to kill her daughter. And he said, by her forgiving me, she has released me from the prison of my inhumanity. And I thought, wow, you yeah. know? And um, today they have an NGO together. Right. So that was a huge influence on my own decisions. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's clear that in your work and the work of the Pan Circle, lots of micro victories, right? You're convincing, but uh, isn't it also the case that the macro picture in Israel today is more and more hostile to the possibility of peace? At least looking at it from the outside, it seems as if we are further away than we've ever been. Uh, how, do, how, does, how do you hope to change that? You see, you can't give up. It's like sometimes taking water out of the sea with a teaspoon. But you cannot give up. I look at my grandchildren, and I think of the opportunities that they have, and how, and what will their future be? Are we going to have more deaths in the family? My, my grandchild is 13. It's only a few years he'll be in the army. He won't have any choice. So, you know, the maddest thing is he had to wear glasses, and suddenly I was happy. I thought maybe he won't have to go to a fighting unit. This is how insane your mind becomes, you know? Right. And I look at these kids and I think, what is their future? And yes, this is the worst government we've ever had. And yes, if Israel doesn't get out of the occupied territories, and the sooner the better it will be destroyed, because this occupation is killing the moral fiber of Israel. If you look at a young soldier who stands at a checkpoint and has to make decisions far beyond his years, and by the way, the more ancient that I get, the younger these soldiers look to me, they look like babies. 
and they're standing there, and sometimes I think to myself, I don't know who's more frightened, them or the people that are coming through, and so they become even more abusive, right. that right. fear. And then pregnant woman might come to the checkpoint, and they may not let her go through, and she may have the baby. This is this not happened, fiction. Right? Yeah, it yeah, happens. Like, this like, is not fiction. Right. So he goes home. What can he do? He d sometimes they come to tell us, because sometimes the babies die or the woman dies. And then um, he takes his father's car and he gets drunk and, he, and more people are killed on the roads right. in Israel right. than in the conflict. Right. There's more physical violence, there's more domestic violence. You cannot occupy a country for more than 50 years nearly and, and expect it not to, uh, to affect the moral fiber. And of course that is one of, I, no, it's not even a political decision, it's an obvious decision. And I'm just hoping, I don't know, this is the worst government we've ever had, I suppose I shouldn't really, you know, because we're not political, that's my, my opinion, it's not, uh, and I'm sure it's probably shared very widely by the parent circle, because it's so destructive, right. it's so racist. Right. What can people around the world do, and people in India do, uh, to help the cause of peace and justice in Israel and Palestine? Is there something specific? or general that we could do? We created a project for women. I think it's terribly important that women come to the table now. Nobody asks us, shall we go to war? Nobody asks us, shall we sign a peace agreement? And we are the ultimate victims. And so we have a very, very uh, active women's group now. And one of the projects that we're doing is called Taking Steps. Um, it's firstly to increment income for women from Palestine. So we make these shoes with the embroidered bird and we have a patch. And women all over the world in June will be wearing them. And they will be saying, for instance, the House of Commons, the European Union, uh, yeah, Parliament, Congress. It's amazing, there's magic in these shoes. There are also patches that you can buy with the lace. And um, they will make statement, the woman I'm wearing them for, or the woman I'm running for, or I'm walking for reconciliation. Right. And they will take a picture of themselves and send it to a website that we will have. And this is a way that you can support peace because don't be pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. Be pro-solution because if you don't, you import our, con our conflict into your country and create hatred between Jews and Muslims. On that note, Ravi Damelin, mother, grandmother, activist with the Pan <laughs> Circle, thank you very much for joining thank us you. on Rajya Sabha TV. Thank you. That wraps up this episode of IST. Do join us again next week with another guest. Thank you for watching.